Evening. My name is uh, Gavin Cleesbys. I am the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you to our virtual program, Lost on the Freedom Trail. Uh, we have a large group joining us this evening, so there may be some people who are visiting MHS virtually for the first time. Uh, so I'm happy to extend an extra welcome to anyone who uh, may be unfamiliar with the organization. We are the oldest historical society in America, dating back to 1791. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library that provides access to a remarkable collection of manuscripts, including the papers of three U.S. presidents, as well as soldiers, mothers, poets, and protesters. We host a wide variety of programs on topics related to Massachusetts and American history for both the public and academic audiences. Uh, we're only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members. We hope you'll return for future events and we'll hope that you'll support our work by becoming a member or making a donation to support MHS. This evening, we are joined by Seth Bergman from Temple University, who will be joined in conversation by Michael Creasy, the General Superintendent of the National Parks of Boston, uh, and Susan Feinstein from Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design. Professor Bergman uh, will begin the conversation with a 15 minute overview of his book, Lost on the Freedom Trail, which is being published by the University of Massachusetts Press. Uh, when we scheduled this originally, we thought that this book would be available. Um, I think that it's actually still in production um, and should be available, I think by the end of February. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, in the book, uh, Professor Bergman uh, takes a critical look at the Boston National Historic Park and the Freedom Trail arguing that making sense of the American Revolution was never the primary aim for the planners who reimagined Boston's heritage landscape after the Second World War. Rather, the Freedom Trail was largely designed to lure affluent white Americans into downtown revival schemes, and that its success hinged on a narrow vision of the city's history run through with old stories about heroic white men. Following Professor Bruggeman's uh, presentation, we'll be joined by Mr. Creasy and Professor Feinstein uh, for a moderated conversation. Finally, we'll open the program to questions uh, from the audience at the end. So without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to Seth if you'd like to, to tell us a little bit about your project. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. And I wanna thank Gavin and Olivia for putting this together. Uh, and tolerating my uh, atrocious email habits. Um, so let's, uh, let me just start things off by telling you about the project. Uh, so the point of this book uh, is to really grapple with why it was and how it was uh, that the Boston National uh, Historical Park got made when it was made, it was authorized by Congress in 1974, um, figure out how it got made uh, and why and uh, and how um, the park's origin story has impacted how it's done history there ever since. Um, and I, I guess I should specify for those of you who don't know that the uh, park is involved in managing uh, eight historic sites scattered around Boston. Um, there's Bunker Hill, there's the Charlestown Navy Yard, uh, there's Paul Revere's house, there's the old state house, there's Old North Church, uh, Old South Meeting House, and then uh, Dorchester Heights uh, Monument in South Boston. Now, with the exception of Dorchester Heights, uh, all of these sites are bound together by the Freedom Trail, right? That iconic red line uh, that takes us on a journey through, rev uh, through uh, Boston's revolutionary uh, past. Uh, but I should also specify that the park doesn't own that line and it doesn't manage it per se, uh, though it must contend with it uh, because the sites that it is involved in are so tightly bound up uh, with the Freedom Trail. So I became interested uh, in this story several years ago when the Park Service approached me uh, in partnership with the Organization of American Historians and asked me to write an administrative history uh, of the park. Uh, now, an administrative history is a, is a management document. It's an internal document. It's a big kind of hawking institutional history uh, that parks uh, compile when they're going through a planning process. Uh, and I had done one of these before, so I knew something about it. And in fact, um, the one I had done before shared themes with uh, Boston's story uh, as we, uh, as at least the project team presented it uh, to me. And one of those themes was uh, what we might call a contest of memory. Uh, there had been moments where there were friction, there was friction uh, 
uh, uh, at the, the, the core of the story of this park between the National Park Service uh, and some of its partners along the Freedom Trail. And that friction had to do with uh, how history should be told uh, in Boston. How do we narrate the story of the, the revolution? And this fascinated me because this is what I study. Uh, I, I specialize in the history of memory and I study National Park Service history. So I was excited about this project and I jumped in, I did some research uh, and it's so often the case uh, when you, you begin a project like this, you, you quickly sometimes find out that the story is more complicated than, than what you thought at first. And that was the case here. Uh, it, it turned out the digger I dove into the archive the more it seemed uh, that what defined the relationship between the park and the Freedom Trail was not difference, it wasn't friction so much uh, as it was similarity. Uh, there were some challenges, especially in the 1990s and 2000s uh, in terms of uh, the park and its partners uh, uh, having different ways of thinking about doing history in Boston. Uh, but the further back in the archive I dug, uh, I was, uh, impressed, uh, surprised, I guess is the right word, by how similar these entities were and how much they had in common in terms of the people uh, organizing them and their goals um, uh, and their institutional structures. And it startled me uh, in part because I wasn't any longer sure why a national park, a national historical park got made in Boston if there was already such a, a powerful and strong heritage infrastructure functioning in the city? It was an intriguing question. It became the question uh, around which I organized my research. And what I ended up finding is that uh, you can really identify uh, at least, maybe there are more, more that I don't know about, but at least three origin stories uh, behind Boston National Historical Park. And they all come together and interrelate in interesting ways. And what I wanna do uh, quickly, as quick as I can, uh, is talk about each in turn. And if we have a few minutes later, we can kind of think about how these stories speak to one another. Um, so number one, and we'll call the first story the Dorchester Heights story, uh, because uh, really the first formal interest in creating something that looks like a national historical park in Boston uh, centralizes around uh, the monument at Dorchester Heights, the Dorchester Heights Monument. And this conversation begins in the 1930s. Uh, it's initiated by Representative John McCormick, uh, who by about 1937 thereabouts, becomes very interested in getting the federal government involved in protecting the Dorchester Heights Monument. For those of you who don't know, this monument was built in the 1890s. Uh, it commemorates the evacuation of the British uh, after the siege of Boston early in the revolution. Uh, and it had become the epicenter of uh, annual celebrations uh, of evacuation day on March 17th. Um, that also coincide as you likely know with uh, annual celebrations of St. Patrick's Day on March 17th. And this is a big party uh, was and is uh, in South Boston uh, back then with the majority Irish population. Um, and there was concern within that Irish community by the 1930s about changes in the community and especially the increase in the number of, um, of, of black people, especially moving in, changing the racial uh, dynamic of, of South Boston. McCormick was very sensitive to this. So his interest in interesting the federal government in protecting the monument had to do with celebrating um, uh, Irish American nationalism and, and investing in that community. In any event, more, McCormick petitions the Park Service to involve the federal government of Dorchester Heights. He can do this under the new National Historic Sites Act of 1935. Uh, and so the Park Service sends uh, an agent to speak with him, a fellow named Edwin Small, who um, I was an up and coming MPS historian, uh, trained at Yale, hired on during the New Deal. Uh, had spent some time at Salem National Historic Site as a superintendent um, during the during the mid '30s, and um, became very involved in early phases of urban renewal in Salem. Became an advocate for the kind of park building uh, wherein uh, buildings not deemed historically significant would be demolished and residents moved out, and those deemed important would be preserved. 
Uh, and, uh, and Small had also spent much of the 1930s cataloging sites around New England that could be folded into a national park uh, when that uh, might happen. He came, he spoke with McCormick. McCormick made his argument for protecting Dorchester Heights and Small uh, said quite um, curtly, uh, no, we're not interested. Uh, Small didn't believe that the Dorchester Heights Monument rose to the level of significance necessary to bring the federal government into a preservation role. Uh, and as you might imagine, this upset McCormick a great deal. Uh, now his anger was delayed a bit because World War II uh, put the conversation off uh, for several years, but when it was over, McCormick returned and he still wanted to involve the federal government uh, at Dorchester Heights and went looking for new strategies which introduces our second origin story, what we might call the Freedom Trail story. So as McCormick looked around Boston uh, after World War II uh, during the early 50s, he noticed that there was uh, an explosion of heritage tourism happening uh, in the city. And this tourism was gravitating around a brand new tourist attraction called the Freedom Trail. The Freedom Trail debuted in 1951 uh, the idea for such a thing had been floating around Boston for quite some time, um, but it was uh, only then that a local newspaper man, after sort of pitching the idea in the Boston Traveler, uh, caught the attention of the mayor, um, who uh, thought it was a beautiful idea. The, the pitch was, let's create a walking tour uh, that will help tourists from getting lost when they come to see uh, say, Paul Revere's house or Bunker Hill. Uh, the mayor loved this idea, um, talked with his friends, put some resources behind it, and activated two organizations, one, the Boston Ag Club uh, and the Boston Chamber of Commerce, um, and had them form committees to help in partnership manage this new, uh, this, uh, new um, uh Trail. And so when McCormick looked around and he saw this, he thought, wait a minute, why simply pitch um, Dorchester Heights for federal protection? Why not ask the Park Service to consider creating an entire national park uh, in downtown Boston, a historical park that, of course, would fold in Dorchester Heights? And that's precisely the strategy he used. He flexed his muscle in Washington. And before long, the president of the United States constitutes a federal commission to study the problem of creating a national historical park in Boston. Uh, the commission gets put together in 1955, uh, has seven commissioners. Some of them you will know, Tip O'Neill is in this group. Um, it includes Senator Saldenstall, uh, the uh, director of the National Park Service, Conrad Worth, uh, his agent in the regional office as well, um, preservationist Louise Crowninshield um, uh, is there. Um, and then the fellow chosen to lead the commission uh, is a, a man named Mark Bortman, uh, who's a local industrialist, uh, plastics magnet, um, big fan of Paul Revere. And it just so happens also the past chair of the Chamber of Commerce's uh, Heritage Committee, which of course was in charge of running the Freedom Trail. So you can kind of see where this is going. The Boston National Historic Sites Committee uh, is staffed by a bunch of folks who are very much committed to that uh, Freedom Trail model. Um, the problem is that the commission is completely dysfunctional. <laughs> it can't get anything done. The members argue with one another. Uh, they're unfocused. Uh, they don't have enough money to do the work they need to do. And so after about a year and a half of spinning their wheels, uh, the Park Service suggests, maybe we can provide somebody to help you get on task. Uh, a chief of party, we'll appoint a person to do this. And we know just the guy, his name is Edwin Small, <laughs> right? Remember Small from our, our previous origin story um, who had come up at, at Salem uh, as superintendent and had been thinking about what a national park uh, in the area might look like for, for decades at that point. Uh, so Small comes in and rather aggressively takes up the job of leading the commission. And in an interview years later, he says, uh, he kind of admits that he actually just took over. He, he took over their work um, uh, and began writing a report. And the commission ends up proposing in 1961, 
a model for a new um, National Historical Park in Boston. Um, it's a fascinating document. Uh, it proposes something that um, it sounds pretty familiar. It looks a lot like the Freedom Trail. Um, there are four or five sites that will be included uh, in this proposal. They will function in a kind of loose confederation, partnerships between the Park Service and the uh, historical organizations that have been managing these places for, for decades. Um, uh, there's not a lot of detail about how those partnerships will work, but they're proposed. Uh, and then also in this proposal, um, and this reveals Small's hand very clearly, um, is uh, the suggestion that there be a demolition and um, the removal of residents uh, and destruction of properties that interfere in appreciating uh, historic buildings such as Paul Revere's home. Um, and so this is the proposal that comes from the commission. Uh, and then it becomes the job of politicians throughout the 1960s to try and get public support for it, to create that park. But it's a very hard sell. Uh, Tip O'Neill uh, works on this, uh, Ted Kennedy works on this. The hassle is by 1961, um, uh, ideas about urban renewal have changed uh, significantly. Ed Logue has arrived in Boston to come up with a new plan of community engaged, less invasive um, urban redevelopment. Uh, and so uh, a plan that, that showcases uh, demolition and uh, the removal of residents from these areas is bound to be unpopular, and it is. And there is significant popular pressure against the politicians to not create this kind of park. Um, and so goes the campaign to, to create the national park for, for several years. I mean, there's a, a long push, um, but it doesn't look good until two things happen. And here's where we get to our third origin story. The last one, I promise. Um, two bits of bad news uh, bring us this story, which we could call the bicentennial story. Here's the bad news. One bit comes in 1968, the federal government announces that it is going to close the Navy Yard in Charlestown. Uh, Boston is already wrestling with uh, problems of deindustrialization and collapsing job and economic base. Um, the Navy Yard uh, provided uh, income and jobs. And so this is bad news uh, in Charlestown and, and for the city more broadly. Um, and then a second bit of bad news in 1970, uh, Boston had uh, applied to be the national headquarters for the upcoming celebration of the nation's bicentennial. Uh, and it learns that's not going to happen, nor is all of the anticipated federal money going to come um, as uh, planners had hoped in Boston. And so this sends folks into a kind of tailspin, uh, especially urban planners, uh, and folks who are getting ready to, to, to cash in on the bicentennial. And so there's effort invested in trying to create a possibility out of the problems. And the Boston Redevelopment Authority floats a plan. Why don't we build a big history theme park in the old Navy Yard? We'll put some historic ships there. We'll, we'll build some, some kind of condos out of old factories um, and we'll um, create a marketplace connected to the Freedom Trail, and it'll bring in lots of tourist revenue for us. This plan gets folks very excited in Boston, everybody that is except for the National Park Service, which though advocating for a history park in Boston for many years, never imagined that it would include the Navy Yard, right? Which creates uh, lots of problems intellectually. How does the chron chronology work? Uh, the revolution in the Navy Yard doesn't quite fit economically. How could it work? How could the Park Service sustain such a big park geographically? How can it work uh, over two sides of the river? And so the Department of the Interior comes out uh, in the early 1970s and says, we do not support it. Don't create the park. Uh, so the Park Service effectively argues against creating uh, the unit that has been advocating for for some time. Congress is not interested, it's specifically focused on uh, jobs and redevelopment. And the park gets authorized in 1974. Um, and I see Gavin popping into the window, which means I need to stop. Um, so I won't go on for long, but what I will tell you is that the book then tries to make sense of this very difficult moment. What will the managers of this new National Historical Park do? 
going forward? How will they make sense of it? How will they make it work? How will they do it on a small budget? Um, and how will they make sense of the significance of the park itself? And I end up arguing that one of the ironies of these intertwined origin stories is that this historical park ends up not being able to think often historically about its own position in Boston and the problems that it faces. Um, many of these problems concern issues of structural racism. Uh, certainly this park is born at the height of the busing crisis in a, in a moment of uh, intense racial tumult. Uh, they can't really engage with that story historically. Um, that remains a problem. And I would argue going forward that the, um, the park uh, struggles uh, to understand that in many ways, the Freedom Trail um, itself is a, a story uh, about post-war uh, renewal and economies, uh, racial animosities, class struggles, uh, that is worthy of historical interpretation, but never can quite get interpreted, right? Because how can the park interpret itself? Um, which is exactly what I think it needs to do. Uh, in any event, uh, I hope that frames the conversation. Gavin, let me uh, pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Seth. And I'm happy to invite uh, Susan and Michael to, to join us. Um, <clears throat> And I thought, uh, since both Susan uh, and Michael have um, have read this book um, and have some familiarity with it, um, if you would like, do you have questions uh, for Seth? Um, is there something you'd like to know? And perhaps we could uh, start with Michael, since your camera seems to be working better. Sure, Seth. Um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I, Seth mentioned, and I, I just want to really re emphasize this: is um, he talked about kind of what. Um, what he did for the National Park Service in terms of writing the administrative history for Boston National Historical Park from the very early days all the way up through to 2013-15. And so I think, um, you know, I just wanted to, to make sure everybody understood that uh, that administrative histories are, are really important to people like myself as a park manager. Um, they're, they're really intended to reveal the decision-making of my predecessors, right? And, and kind of how those decisions were made um, and how they were reflected into these broader kind of social, economic, uh, cultural, political trends um, uh, throughout the city, as well as in the National Park Service. And I think uh, Loss on the Freedom Trail does a really good job of kind of really holistically presenting a lot of that package. Um, I must say, though, in, in reading the book, I appreciated the insights of how the park idea emerged in Boston, as, as you just described in your three components. I thought the broader connections, the politics and societal issues here in Boston were, were fascinating. Um, I thought the partners involved in the eventual establishment of uh, the park and then uh, its management um, I have some issues with, but um, I, I thought overall were good. But here's all in all to say that administrative histories are incredibly important to parks as well as park managers for how do we begin to look at um, what we inherited as, as kind of looking towards the future. But um, there, were, there were sections of this book that I found, as I said, fascinating and other parts really painful to, to read through. And no surprise, Seth, I'm sure, as you, you might know. And I think part of it is because you're probably as passionate as I am about national parks and you just want us to be the best we can be. Um, but you, you conclude the book with a not so rosy painting of the belief that the national park service can, I think, as you call it, do good history. Um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to work with the second century commission for the national park service and um, through a series of, of different um, iterations and, but the, the chair of the National Park Service Advisory Board um, during the Second Century Commission was, was uh, Dr. John Hope Franklin. And I've always been inspired with the, the report that he authored on rethinking the National Park Service for the 21st century. And I quote him all the time in the, in the opening of the book that says, the creation of a national park is an expression of faith in the future. It's a pact between generations, a promise from the past to the present to the future. To me, that's inspiring. And I guess my question to you, Zeth, is do you see any of the same hope that was seen by Chairman Franklin for the National Park Service as, I move, as we try and move forward? 
Oh boy! I mean, that's the big question. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know it's a tough one, probably. <laughs> it's the hardest one. I mean, obviously, I do, or else I wouldn't do this work, as you point out, Michael. And it's you know, it's a real um, you know, the work I've done with and for the Park Service is all born of a, a feeling of uh, commitment to its mission. In some ways, debt because it supported me uh, as a, as a young historian in many ways, and I see so much democratic potential uh, in the agency and its work. Um, the, the challenge, though, I find is that uh, in every project I've engaged with, the agency has such a difficult problem seeing itself, right, or understanding how it fits into the communities around it. Um, and this is a problem it's wrangled with consistently. But in um, writing this administrative history, you know, what has struck out, to, uh, sort of struck me as, as especially profound is that over all the years it took to <laughs> go from the original idea of the park to authorization, which is a really long story, people were watching, right? What was happening in Boston? And um, we know because there is community activism that there was concern about the way that this park was getting made. Um, certainly black folks in South Boston were very aware of the way that the agency was situating itself. Um, uh, certainly people in Charlestown were, were kind of aware of, of what was happening with uh, development and with the Navy Yard. And so there's a story that the agency was telling about itself inadvertently all, of that, all those years, um, and, but was never able to recognize that those folks kind of received the story. So you see all these these reports um, that come out later on where um, planners will say, we need to make communities understand the importance of this park. Why can't people understand the importance of the park? And it seems to me that people in Boston really understood the, the park very well and how embedded it was in those early years, right? And these, these structural problems of racism and privilege. And so I think if there's hope going forward, it, it, it has to be in... Uh, reflexivity, uh, getting the park service to really look at itself in the mirror, understand the story that it has told inadvertently for so long, um, and to, to grapple with that. And the challenge in Boston is that the, the Freedom Trail, the line itself, a red line, a declarative red line, <laughs> that, that although it changes in some ways over the decades, is, is you know connotes uh, fixity. It sends a message about history um, that it's it's not uh, the narrative is not open for change by those who don't have the power to, to write those stories. And I think the agency could dig in in a really powerful way and open up uh, authorship, right? Expand authority uh, beyond uh, um, into those communities that have watched it grow all through the years. So that's. That's, you know, that's my way of, of skipping the hardest question there is to answer by talking a bit. I about, think I heard a little bit of hope in there. There's so. a little bit of hope. There's a bit in there for you. <laughs> uh, Susan, did you have yeah. a uh, Well, many years ago, I read a book that I only remember somewhat about the national parks by a fellow named Ronald Foresta. And he essentially argued that once the National Park Service moved away from Yosemite and Yellowstone and the big you know, parks which were supposed to make Americans love nature, I guess, uh, that it never exactly knew what it was supposed to be doing in any place, particularly in the urban parks. Uh, are, are the urban parks, and you write the book uh, mainly from the point of view of the park belonging to Boston, but of course it is a national park, not just Boston's park. Uh, so it becomes a question of what, sh what message should the park be giving to people who come from elsewhere, not just to people who live in Boston? Uh, so I think that that's one issue and, and you need to, st well, you're not gonna rewrite the book, but I guess uh, you need to state a little more clearly what you think national parks should be doing. And the very last chapter you say, well, it should be a schoolroom. And I was thinking, well, you know, I don't suppose these people coming from, uh, my hometown of Cleveland, idea of a vacation is really going to a schoolroom. And so, yes, the parks 
need to interpret history, but they also are, I'm not sure what else. You say they're just commodity, commodified. I'm not sure that's exactly true, but that um, what they're supposed to be doing is, is very vague. I think it's vague to the Park Service, and I think it's kind of simply not exactly clear, and it finally comes down to, well, since the National Park is in all these partnerships with all these different Boston um, institutions, that its main function seems to be actually to provide a financial, in uh, some financing that otherwise wouldn't be available, and then to provide these various interpretive guides, uh, and that uh, the interpretive guides are, you know, they're not historians. Uh, and you are. I mean, one of the things that's very clear is it really bothers you uh, that the people who are giving the historical uh, narrative aren't professional historians and don't go about it the way a professional historian would. But I'm not sure that people coming to the park are really looking to get a history lesson. Uh, they're sort of going, well, part of the people are going because they just want to see old buildings. Uh, and that a lot of the force for preservation was, in fact, a force to counter urban renewal, uh, where the original urban renewal in Boston, as we all know, but in most places, uh, was this basically destruction of the historic uh, architecture, that a lot of the impetus for um, the Freedom Trail and the park really was architectural preservation. Uh, rather than preservation of a narrative history of Boston and the United States. Uh, and I'm not sure that's illegitimate. And in fact, it was the preservationists that, protect, that protected what was and remained in Boston. Uh, one of the issues you raise, but I don't think the park can do much about it, is that uh, historic preservation tends to produce gentrification. Uh, and uh, certainly it has been an instrument in Boston for gentrification, uh, but dealing with gentrification is a much larger issue than whatever it is a park uh, should be doing. So I'll leave it there, I've talked long enough. <laughs> No, I mean there, there are there there are many questions I think embedded in your in your your comments. Um, I mean I can say that one topic that really interests me in the book is this relationship between private and public capital as it you know, manifests in the story of the Park Service. And you know so the purpose of the Park Service is quite clear. It's to preserve and interpret uh, significant resources in perpetuity. Uh, this the significance is defined by the the agency. And the question is, how does one do that, right? This is the classic contradictory mandate. How can you preserve important cultural resources and make them accessible to everybody? It's almost impossible. And what we know about the Park Service is that by uh, World War II, it, it functionally can't do that job anymore uh, because it's been broken down financially. Um, without the largesse of the New Deal. It's loved to death as uh, Park Service people often love to say, um, visitors use it up as it were. And so after World War II, um, the agency um, uh, tries a new approach, what uh, was called the Mission 66 Project, right? Which is uh, essentially a, a kind of gamble. Um, can we stay alive? by developing these strong partnerships uh, with private capital uh, in various parts of the, the, the agency. Uh, and it's tricky business. Um, private capital has always been in, in part of the Park Service story from the very beginning, right? Uh, railroads love the idea of developing hotels around Grand Canyon and elsewhere. But it's really after World War II that we, we see that model mature. Um, in important ways. And one of the arguments of the book is that that model matures at that moment in part because the agency is sort of using the technologies of urban renewal uh, and modeling its own uh, method after urban renewal. Boston is the place to study this transition um, because it's not fully a Mission 66 park. Uh, it's kind of an experimental place. There's some Mission 66 monies that pop in at, at some point down the road, but it's not conceived of that as that. 
And so there's a lot of experimentation there. It's often called the first partnership park, right, for this reason. Um, and so I think you can use Boston as a really interesting test case um, for how this approach to, to park management works in the early 20th century. And I don't disparage it out of hand as something that's bad. I mean, the agency was trying to survive uh, and this is one way to do it. Where things break down, I think, is um, going back to the mission of the park service to preserve and interpret. I think things break down in that balance between preservation and interpretation, right? And what we see um, happen is, as you point out, Susan, uh, people with money who want to pay for such things as preservation don't necessarily also want to fund very complicated stories <laughs> about the past. Um, and so uh, the challenge in Boston then is, well, how, how do you do preservation in a way that taps into those uh, networks of capital that can help you protect uh, old and important buildings, but can also allow you to do interpretation that makes those stories meaningful for uh, more than just wealthy uh, white folks. Um, and that's, that's the problem um, that we bump into in Boston at every unit. I mean, this is not just a story about Boston, right? It's really a story about the National Park Service uh, and whether it can ever fully achieve its mandate to serve all Americans equally. So thanks for your questions. I, I appreciate them. So I have a, a couple questions for uh, Michael and Susan, and then some broader questions for uh, different configurations of, of the group. Um, Michael, uh, five or six years ago, the National Park Service celebrated its 100th anniversary. Uh, you mentioned to being on the second century uh, planning team. Um, obviously, anniversary is, you know, are arbitrary. 100 years is not fundamentally different than 107 years, but uh, people like round numbers. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about how MPS uh, has changed in recent years uh, by expanding the scope and diversity of narratives and cultural landscapes and history that are preserved? Um, I'm thinking on a national level of sites like Little Rock Central High School or Stonewall, uh, but also interested in your thoughts about how some of the uh, partnership sites within Boston have evolved recently. I'd just like to speak to that. Sure. Um, I think 100 years is a good milestone, though. Sorry, it's <laughs> better than 107, Gavin. Um, I, you know, I um, before coming to Boston, I was the director of the National Park Service Stewardship Institute. Um, and um, at the time, I was asked to specifically look at both large landscapes, like how do parks fit in with these larger landscapes? And in particular, I spent most of my time looking at urban parks and, and cities and how national parks and urban areas really kind of fit in and and what is the relevance of urban parks uh, to the American people? I think you get to that both um, Susan and Seth in different ways. But it was no surprise to us as we began to kind of, you know, kind of do survey work, understand, you know, how what are the perceptions of national parks that, as was mentioned earlier, is that the perception is, is that they're all big Western landscapes with snow-capped mountains and geyser basins, right? It's the Yellowstones, it's the Yosemites, it's the Great Waterfalls. And, um, you know, I think there's a blessing and a curse with that. I think the blessing is, is that people know what national parks are. They just don't know kind of the breadth and depth and uh, the diversity of, I think, what our national heritage represents within the National Park Service. And so I think as we began to look at urban parks, I just started counting up how many urban, how, how many parks were in metropolitan areas. And over 35% of parks in the system, probably even more now, are, are in urban metropolitan areas. So that's pretty substantial. And the budget is probably 50% of that. Um, so, I mean, I think I, I also have a planning background. I spent some time as a park planner and in legislative affairs uh, in earlier part of my career. Um, you know, it was clear to me that as I looked at planning processes that they were for well-defined boundary parks, right? That the fed, feds owned it. They managed it. It was somewhat of an inward practice of looking at, you know, kind of management policies and things like that. And I think uh, we were very much challenged with the advent of urban national parks. And so I think we're still trying to kind of wrestle with that, as I think Seth has alluded to. I think also we were also looking at uh, how we really began to think more expansively about landscapes um, and our role within those larger landscapes. Um, as well as history and engagement. Um, so I, I guess 
I think most people would be surprised if you looked back at the designations of national parks in the last 25 years and the types of these parks and how expanded and diverse the narratives are, um, how cultural landscapes and history are much more inclusive and engaged with their communities than uh, people's perceptions of what national parks are all about. Um, and just, uh, just as uh, for, you mentioned Stonewall, you mentioned Little Rock Central High School, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, people don't know that uh, Brown versus Board of Education is, is a national park here. Uh, Fort McRow came in um, in, in 2010-11, I think, um, as a national park. Cesar Chavez, Chavez came in as a national park. Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad, Birmingham Civil Rights, uh, Freedom Riders, the Reconstruction Era. Um, and I think our mo most recent, I was, I was looking this up uh, the other day, but Medgar and, and uh, Murley Evers, it's, it's a, a small home that represents uh, civil rights activists that ran a movement out of their home. Um, and that was just designated last year. So, I mean, if you think about like where we've come from, from the perception that national parks are just about um, Yellowstones, um, and now looking at how broad and expansive national parks uh, have become uh, with, I think, the American people's desire to expand what they consider American heritage. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's a telltale for, you know, where we see the role of the National Park Service in this, in this nation. I guess in terms of your question related to Boston, I think as part of the urban agenda that was that was uh, uh, published, um, the, you know, Boston was uh, the city was the one of the parks across the country that the Park Service saw an opportunity to test out new ways for activating what was spelled out in the urban agenda, and that was really around relevance, really around kind of opportunities for for, for more vo voices, uh, more diverse voices uh, to be heard in uh, the national park narrative and our nation's narrative. Um, but I know we have a long way to go, but I think, you know, my five and a half years that I've been here in Boston, um, I've seen us really make some incredible shifts in terms of how do we work in partnerships. And sometimes, you know, that's a really difficult thing, but I think it's really important for a place like Boston, as well as just the kind of the expansion of the types of programs and the stories um, that we're coming up with or that we're um, developing with our partners. Um, and then just, I think the creative solutions for what Zeff has recognized, and that is the incredible burden that has been put upon us with, you know, an annual, annual appropriation for a, an organization that lives in perpetuity. And that's a really hard thing to, to be a good steward when you're never sure what next year's funding source might look like. So unless you're the defense department. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, yeah. so, so that's kind of, I think kind of the, the role I, I see us kind of uh, futuristically kind of thinking about ourselves and how far we've come, but Susan might have some. So, um, Susan, uh, we had a, a couple of questions for you as well, and, and then we'll try to, I think that we're probably running relatively low on time. So uh, I think we'll do one question for Susan and then a question for the whole group. Um, Susan, based on your work in, uh, on the urban theory of justice with an understanding of operating within what is feasible or possible within a capitalist urban structure, uh, what do you think of Seth's critique of the relationship between the park, tourism, costs and benefits, uh, redevelopment and gentrification? Do you have some mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Well, I think in Boston, the housing crisis, the cost of housing and gentrification is an extraordinary problem. And I suppose the National Park and the Freedom Tale have contributed to it, but I'm not sure that it wouldn't, you know, regardless, uh, would not be much different. And that uh, dealing with that is a much bigger question uh, than what the park uh, should be doing. Uh, I am. I'm more in favor of tourism, I think, than, than Seth is. Uh, I've edited a couple of books on tourism. Uh, that uh, tourism in, in European cities and Boston, I suppose, too, this big problem with what they call over-tourism. Uh, but on the other hand, tourism is an industry which in many cities really uh, absorb workers who otherwise had no place else to go that once manufacturing is gone, and we can't blame the park for that, uh, that um, 
uh, it's low wage employment, but it is employment that um, I'm not sure whether Boston's hotels are unionized or not, but in a lot of places, uh, including New York, uh, hotels, workers are unionized. And you don't need to speak English to be uh, made in a hotel. Uh, you, so that it's absorbed immigrant workers in a very big way. Uh, and it's absorbed African-Americans also. Uh, so that um, I think tourism needs to be controlled in ways that it probably hasn't been. And there's an issue of Airbnb and its proliferation. Uh, but that I can't say that, well, turning uh, the Boston National Park into a tourism commodity is as bad a thing as you imply in the book. Uh, so in terms, you know, um, my argument in the book, The Just City, is that uh, uh, the principles of a just city are democracy, equity, and diversity. Well, tourism is an industry which appreciates diversity, I guess I would say, in certain ways it's built on it. Uh, it has an equity aspect in, the, in what I've mentioned in terms of its workforce. Uh, and uh, I guess in terms of democracy, you would say that, uh, you know, it was these Boston politicians who wanted the park. Uh, and that uh, uh, I'm not sure that I would say that John McCormick's lobbying on behalf of Irish Americans uh, is something that should be seen as simply racist. I mean, that the Irish certainly were uh, exploited and downtrodden for a very long period of time before they became uh, as powerful in Boston as they became. And now I guess they're sort of diminishing in terms of their clout. Uh, but that... Uh, you know, acknowledging Irish American history is not such a bad thing. Yeah, it's not bad at all. I mean, McCormick's campaign coincides with a very concerted effort to gerrymander uh, voting districts within South Boston to exclude black voters. Uh, and so it's the confluence of, um, of politics in that moment uh, begs a broad conversation. Uh, about why he was doing what he was doing at the moment. He also was very nervous about his own uh, uh, Irish credibility. His dad was Canadian uh, and he kept that private um, because he knew it would compromise his political standing. Um, <laughs> but to bolster it, he relied on the fact that he also had a brother uh, who was Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade for many years, uh, who was known as uh, Nako McCormick. <laughs> so, so McCormick is a pretty colorful character, uh, worth investigating more. So um, I think there are some great questions from the audience. I think it would be wonderful to have them. Uh, I just have one question for the for uh, all three of you, um, which is uh, that uh, I'm involved with a group who are thinking of planning another trail in Boston, an innovation trail in Boston. Um, this trail, of course, has a lot of the same pitfalls. Uh, you know, sites of innovation are places where there's concentration of resources and wealth often. Uh, so, you know, Mass General Hospital, of course, is going to be a stop. Um, the Boston State House is going to, or the Massachusetts State House is going to be uh, prominent. Uh, and of course, Kendall Square. Um, and it again is looking for a space that is walkable in a relatively manageable amount of time. So you have the same danger of falling into highlighting these places which sort of reinforce um, wealth uh, and concentrations of power. Um, so what advice would you have uh, to a group thinking about this? Because quite literally, we are actually thinking about this like right now. <laughs> like, what, would you, what would you suggest uh, that you approach this as? How would you avoid the pitfalls? How do we have how do we avoid having lost on, on the innovation trail written in 20 years? So, so I, I jump in and say, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the trail as a, a model, um, but I'm a historian. This is thinking about history, right? And, and thinking about planning and, and, and tourism are maybe different concerns. But I would just suggest, Gavin, that, you know, the challenge with the Freedom Trail is that uh, it is an argument about the past pretending as if there is no argument. <laughs> so the Freedom Trail makes choices for you about how you encounter history without you knowing that it's making those decisions. And so if you, if you wanna create a, a, a um, 
innovation trail, my recommendation would simply be to be very, very transparent about the choices. Why these stops, right? And who chose? Um, make, revealing the logic of the line, uh, I guess is one way you could put it, is one way to diffuse some of the, 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 the problems that I think we see happen along the Freedom Trail. Uh, Michael or Susan, do you have comments on this? I don't quite know what counts as an innovation. And one could uh, call the subway system an innovation, for example. Uh, one could talk about abolitionism as an innovation. I mean, there, it's sort of too easy to see innovation as simply being uh, you know, medical research and uh, computers, and I don't know what it is that you're actually classifying as innovation. Uh, but I guess, and, and here I, I kind of, I do agree with Seth, that there's a certain sort of canned quality to marking a trail, and that um, it kind of tells people what it is they should be identifying as innovation. And maybe it isn't, maybe it'd be better if you made it more problematic. I would concur with, with my colleagues here. <laughs> I have more to give you, Gavin. <laughs> let, let me add just one more quick comment, if I may. And this goes back to Michael's note about, you know, I know Seth is critical of the, the, the park, but it's probably because he, he loves the park service and that's true. And, and I wanna point out that I'm very critical of the Freedom Trail. Um, not because I think it's necessarily a bad thing. Honestly, I think it's one of the most impressive interpretive contrivances I've ever encountered because it really does exercise its power in a way that's almost irrefutable. And it manages um, people in a way that's really powerful, but allowing that power to unfold without some constraints is the problem. Um, so, um, it's well, a great one. Can I say something about that? I, knowing that I was going to be doing this tonight, I was speaking with a, a friend who's a member, of, who's a um, head of um, the board of the New Haven Historic Trust and who loves the Freedom Trail. She says, I've been on it 15 times. I just love it. And uh, she said, I don't want to know the bad things that rather I look at the aspirations of um, the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or whatever that, uh, yeah, these people may have had feet of clay, but she wants to go along with Martin Luther King and look at the better angels of their nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm not sure that the hagiography is necessarily a bad thing. So, I mean, I guess I would say that there's uh, some danger in confusing public service with choosing your publics. Um, so that is one audience that you're identifying. What about the other audiences? Um, and so that's that's the issue along the Freedom Trail. Um, we had a question from an audience member um, who said, um, how did the Black Heritage Trail and the Boston Women's Heritage Trail affect or expand the stories told by Boston National Historic Park on the Freedom Trail? And I guess Seth or Michael, you can respond to that. Um, so, so I, I, I have some thoughts about this. I, I talk about specifically the, 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 the Black Heritage Trail in the book and its genesis, although there's a new study coming out, a new administrative history of that unit, which is a discrete unit, um, which I hope to learn from too. Um, and that's a fascinating story. And in part, it was instigated by Byron Rushing, um, who was, as far as I can tell, the only voice uh, in 1974 that was uh, insisting that somebody recognize the fact that um, the story that was going to be enshrined by this park was one that um, uh, was the story of the nation being built on the backs of enslaved people. And uh, he was asked by Ted Kennedy to, to consult and said, you know, look, um, I, I will talk with you after a few years, get this thing up and running. And then we can talk. And, and he became the, the inspiration behind the Black Heritage Trail, which organized itself very differently than the Freedom Trail. Freedom Trail, largely about uh, tourism, development, profit. Black Heritage Trail, very much organized about 
uh, around research and scholarship um, and activating, especially uh, black folks who wanted to engage um, in their history. Um, the question for me has always been, is it a good idea to have all these different trails, right? Um, this feels a little bit like separate but equal to me, which we know is never a good thing. Um, and there have been various arguments over the years at the park uh, about <clears throat> um, why it is good to have a discrete black uh, history trail. Um, and I find those persuasive sometimes. Uh, but honestly, I'm left feeling like there's a kind of fracture um, that from a historical perspective is, is deeply problematic. I can just say in terms of the Black Heritage Trail and um, you know, the Museum of African American History and how that ties in with uh, the distinct you know, Boston African American National Historical Society um, and Boston National Historical Park, you know, I think my, one of my predecessors really kind of you know, really struggled with this in terms of Freedom Trail and the Black Heritage Trail. And I thought it was um, somewhat genius on his part to work with our partners to really begin to kind of blend those stories and really talk about what is on the trail. And I think it's, it demonstrates how parks can be evolving um, in their thought, in their operations and their management. And so this notion that we have become the trails to freedom and what does that mean for more than just some of the people that Seth that you're talking about? But I do think that, you know, there is real meaning to kind of looking at what was established and then over time, how we've evolved. But the idea of like, who, you know, what freedoms are we talking about and for whom? And those are the questions that we're addressing right now. And if you look at what we're doing in terms of like looking at the nation's 250th anniversary and some of the programming that we've undertaken in terms of unfinished on Rev. 250, I think it really begins to kind of answer those types of questions that you've been probing. I think the other thing is, as it relates to Byron Rushing and um, his genius in terms of like holding like because he's he and i've had this conversation but i really do believe he was trying to you know kind of sort things out before just jumping on the bandwagon of boston national historical park and i think you know he was very influential in looking at uh the north slope of beacon hill and, and how this should be presented in a way that's different than maybe boston so I, I just think you know what he said in terms of the middle passage ceremony um one of my first, you know, months uh, coming into Boston was just incredibly powerful in terms of like, we need to first recognize, you know, what is, uh, what is the truth? What is truthful history? And I think from a research standpoint, you're absolutely right. And they continue to do uh, very good research, very good history at Boston African American. And I think you see that uh, reflected in much of, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the new ways that Boston and Trails to Freedom present themselves today. If I could follow up just real quick, and maybe this will be interesting to listeners. Um, and, and the question about the, the Women's Heritage Trail made me want to share this. In some ways, the research for the administrative history and, and then for the book was a test of um, what we can know about a national park by looking at federal records. I mean, in many ways, my research was sort of limited to, to, to working through the, the parks created by the agents or the records created by the agency. And one of the most frustrating uh, research challenges uh, was the fact that so often in the kind of banal day-to-day -day record keeping of, of the parks, women's voices, uh, the voices of people of color are absented in those records uh, in ways that, um, um, again, in here in kind of the, the daily workings of bureaucracy, for instance, so often in meeting minutes, men are identified um, by their last name and position. Women will only show up as a first name. Um, and it became so difficult as a researcher to understand uh, who is in the room at any given point. And we can see in hindsight, this is kind of an artifact of uh, institutionalized sexism and, and racism. And so um, again, as we think about how we do public history and how we build our trails so forth and so on, um, we do need to really think hard uh, uh, about looking um, at how these organizations evolved and, and working really hard to make sure we see where the absences are and the silences in the record that we're, we're working from. Yep.
I, I hate to say it, but we are actually sort of out of time here. Oh. Um, and I wanted to just reiterate um, that Professor uh, Brueggemann's book is uh, not available yet, but it should be available um, in the beginning of March or the end of February. I'm not sure if you have a date on that. We're, we're all waiting. I, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. <laughs> So um, people can certainly keep their eye out for that. Um, and I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Brueggemann, Professor Feinstein, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Creasy uh, for making time for this conversation. I think it's a, a really important conversation. I'm sorry that we uh, only had an hour for it because I think this conversation could go on uh, quite a bit longer. I know that uh, I only scratched the surface of my questions, um, but I'm aware that people have dinner plans. Um, so thank you all for joining us and thank you um, uh, for, for making time to be on our panel. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, pleasure to be here.